So welcome to uh, another live case. Um, um, uh, we are very well seeing you over in Germany with smiling faces. I don't know whether that's a good sign or an intermediate sign or a bad sign. Uh, Stefan, Matti and the rest of the team here, we are in Seoul. Um, bad weather, Seoul has been flooded, but um, now we are listening and seeing and hoping with a good result a case that's very interesting to the Asian physicians because it's widely unknown here. And I'm here together with Professor Kim, who's an extremely experienced um, operator here at, uh, in, in Seoul, together with others, uh, Alan Young among Dr. Flaherty from Northwestern and other Asian friends. So uh, we don't want to spend much time because we want to listen to you and see how you're doing. Welcome and thank you very much for getting this all done. And, yeah, and we have so also Gerald, Gerald Young from Australia. Oh, oh Gerald, yeah, as well. sorry about that, Gerald. He's joining Zoom from Australia too. So it's really wow. international. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for this, Eva. Thanks so much, dear panel of colleagues, uh, for this kind introduction. Welcome here from, from sunny Cologne, so to say. And uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure for us to present to you this patient who we will uh, treat, the transcatheter for a pure aortic regurgitation. To, to show you the case, before we do so, I'd like to introduce the team. As uh, Ebert Gruber already said, so we have Matti Adam here to my side, we have our surgeon, Kave uh, Ekbalzade, we have Dr. Wolf from Anesthesiologist, we have Dr. Körber, who's making our echo pictures today, and we have the colleagues from the team, and we have most of all Zoe, who is uh, helping us on the table. So before we go into the case, we think it's important that you get introduced to the patient and the technique, how we want to treat uh, this patient today. And Mati, perhaps you can give some insight here. Yeah, and, um, sure. Thank you um, for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to show you the patient here. Um, next slide, please. So um, we are planning a Yenavev implantation in a patient with orthopedic rehabilitation. And, um, to briefly walk you through the patient characteristic, it's a 60-year-old female patient, so quite young. Uh, she was highly symptomatic with shortness of breath, New York Heart Association class 2 to 3, and had um, an SDS score of 0.94, so on paper, basically, uh, a low SDS score. But um, it would be a re-operation for her, as she had aortic valve reconstruction and myectomy my in 2008 due to a fibroelastoma, and she had a stroke a year before. So. Uh, she has impaired mobility and Kava is the surgeon on our, on our team. Do you think we, we did like, of course, we discussed it in the heart team before, but would you still think that's a good choice or should we end the procedure here now? Definitely. So <laughs> it was a shared decision making with the patient. And as you already said, the SDS score is uh, underestimating the patient's frailty and uh, the impaired mobility and the reoperation would not justify the reoperation. Great, okay, so as we agree on this, um, we also have severe aortic regurgitation, and we're gonna see more pictures from Dr. Kerber live later on, but it's a tricuspid aortic valve. Um, that's important because uh, otherwise the inner valve would not work, and we have a central defect, uh, basically a type three. We will see pictures of this later. So if we look at the CT of the patient, um, we have a 25.5 millimeter annulus, uh, and a 27 millimeter uh, LVOT, which correlates to a Yena of 27. Um, we have a beautiful tricuspid view over there, and as you see in the left lower corner, uh, no calcification at all. Um, and you can also appreciate in the diastolic phase there the, the central defect on CT. Um, access wise, I think we have a little calcification, but not a big problem. Also, not a very gothic arch. I think access wise, we hopefully don't run into problems. And um, as I, next slide please, as um, not all of you might be aware of that valve, um, I'm just gonna quickly walk you through it. It's a valve that is special in design because it has these three locators um, and every locator should go in the nadir of each coronary cusp. Uh, with that, we hope that we have limited protru protrusion in the LVOT and in the LV. Um, we'll also think that this locator mechanism might clip onto the native leaflets and thereby form a seal and stable securement. And also, that's not so important for the AR cases, but in the discussion of AS, maybe um, we have perfect coronary alignment by, de by design, basically. And um, next slide, please. I just want to shortly and quickly 
walk you through the procedure as planned um, so that we can you know have a little bit more time when we do this live later on so we'll put a long sheath in the stj remove the dilator and then insert the valve which is crimped on that little insertion help there and then get everything into position in the stj so advance the delivery catheter as you see here and then align everything and then remove the sheath and by that we will expose as you can appreciate here these three locators you can then flex the system to get a little bit more central and then uh, advance the system with that two blue button mechanism as you can see now the valve moves forward and we'll, we'll able to freely steer that valve because we want to make sure that the central locator is in an anterior position pointing towards the right coronary cusp and not posterior of course if that's the case we can advance and then um, make sure that the locators are in the nadir and then release the valve as you appreciate in a second so that's the plan i think stefan right so perhaps we can uh, can have a look at the echo itself and, and dr Kerber can walk us through pathology um, of the aortic valve here yeah a warm welcome from behind the curtain here as well i want to start with showing you the left ventricle in echo of our patient as we can appreciate here and we also know from our prior transthoracic studies is the left ventricular ejection fraction is just below 50 percent so we calculated above um, uh, about um, 80, 48 percent. As we can also see here, is that the aortic valve is quietly is quite restrictive in its movement. And what I can also show you here in this short axis is, first of all, as Dr. Adam already said, we can see here a tricuspid valve, of course, and we can also appreciate the little coaptation defect here in the centrum. What we can see here is, first of all, again, the restrictive movement of the valve cusps here on the right side, and again, the coaptation defect in the middle. For the jet itself, the regurgitation is quite central as expected, and we can also see that the regurgitation jet covers approximately 80% of the LVOT area. So this is a sign already for a severe aortic regurgitation. As I calculated the vena contractor here, it is just above six millimeters. So also here we have a um, grade three, so a severe aortic regurgitation with also quite clear signs of hemodynamic relevance with the LV ejection fraction of below 50%. And also what we calculated prior in our transthoracic studies is that the left ventricular and systolic dimension index, this is a very long word, but it is approximately 23. So this also speaks for the clear hemodynamic relevance of the AR in our patient. Okay, and perhaps as a last picture, and then we can discuss the case if you like, uh, we, we show you the fluoro of, of our aortic uh, injection yeah. of contrast. Um, yeah. If you have seen the, the echo, it, it may even underestimate severity, but I, I think you can clearly see that there's entire uh, contrast into the left ventricle. Uh, when injected in the aorta. Yeah, Stefan, uh, thank you very much. Always good to hear familiar voices. I wish I could be there. But it's also fun to be in Seoul, to be honest. And next to uh, uh, Dr. Kim, what do you think about the cases? Any, any comments from the panel? Alan? Can I ask Kim? a question? Um, what kind of aortic valve um, reconstruction did she have before? Is it uh, a resuspension of the aortic valve that was diseased? Can you tell us a little bit more? Aortic aorta surgery as well? Kavi, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, thank you. He's so, a surgeon. So um, it was a fibroelastoma on the right um, cusp, and it was excised with an 11 blade, to be honest. So to be honest, um, somehow um, the beginning of the aortic regurgitation might be uh, iatrogenic, and she had no aortic surgery. It was uh, just the aortic valve reconstruction. What I think what is interesting in this case is that probably the insult was set during the operation and now we have over 14 years a constant deterioration of LV function and enlargement of the left ventricle uh, which, which now makes it necessary even under prognostic, in, in my view at least, under prognostic uh, uh, conditions to, uh, to really undergo uh, the, the valve uh, um, replacement here. Yeah, Jim, any, any comments? Yeah, we, we don't have uh, 
access to the Genevieve in the U.S. outside of trial. So um, the, the use of the commercially available valves has really been uh, really disappointing. So uh, I think this would be a real interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, Gerald, are you, are you uh, familiar with the Genevieve at all? Um, I echo, uh, Jim, uh, we also in Australia don't have access to the uh, Genevieve uh, and certainly uh, the, I mean, we've done it for aortic regurgitation, but typically just uh, using a commercially available valve tends to be more self-expanding valve in Australia gets used uh, by a lot of oversizing. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, I, I, I know you want to be moving forward here and um, tell us what you do and what you plan to do. Yeah, okay. So the situation as of right now is that we inserted an 18 French sheath into the right groin to pre-dilate the situation here. We have a diagnostic multipurpose catheter in the left groin and we have a uh, pacemaker uh, over the jugular vein. And we have a pigtail catheter now in the left ventricle and we now start, we would insert a safari wire and then uh, go forward with uh, inserting the sheath we need for Genovev implantation. In the background, we see they prepare the valve. You know, do you expect any increase in AR when you do the pre-dilatation? Well, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, in, uh, in a patient with pure aortic regurgitation, we wouldn't, we wouldn't pre-dilate. Right, of so course. So this is, uh, this is um, not necessary, but um, as, as you pointed out, obviously this valve can also be implanted in patients with aortic stenosis. In this case, we would be very liberal with respect to um, using a pre-dilatation maneuver. Yeah. So what wire are you using, Stefan? So this is a safari wire, Yeah. just conventional safari wire. That's the regular you know, wire that you're using, right? Exactly, yes. yes. So there's no special wire that you would need if you um, want to implant that valve. We stick to our standard wire, Ivan. Yeah. So we have removed the 18 French sheet now, and now, as you can appreciate here, we we got to put the long sheath in, which has a little curve in the uh, in the distal end, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore will fit in the aortic arch more. So you or increase better. the sheath close and finish close to the. Sinus? Yeah. Exactly. exactly, exactly. You will see this in a second. Yeah. We carefully pass the arch here. And perhaps, uh, Dr. Kerr, perhaps you can remove the uh, echo yeah. system a little bit. And we want to keep it right at the STJ here. I think this is fine. We mm -hmm. can give a little puff of contrast so that, mm -hmm. that everybody can appreciate that we are right. Yep. Yeah. Looks like okay. SCJ. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So now so the I dilator is removed. Let me do this very carefully as the sheath might actually go a little bit out of curvature as you appreciate here. So you can play with the wire a little bit and uh, keep tension on the wire so that the sheath doesn't die. Mati, hold tight. Hold tight. <laughs> I will, Eva, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is. You know, this is on me now here, Ivan. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, you got the wipe? Not, not yet, no? Yes. <clears throat> okay, that's fine. Perfect. So we remove the dilator and then we can just aspirate because it's a long sheath and we're proximal of all the supra arter branches. So can you hold the wire here, Have a, Thank you. Um, so we make sure we have no air bubbles in the sheath. Since the sheath is so long, you have to be very careful with respect to ACT. This is something um, the company makes us aware of. So we have an ACT currently of 300. We would need uh, a documented ACT of above 250 once yeah. we've inserted the system. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so sheath is in place. ACT is fine. Is I got the wire. Yes. And then uh, we can have the system over. Yeah. Great. So what view would you prefer to deploy the Jenna valve in? Is it, uh, I think it's a three cusp, but then it, it, are you trying to do a cusp overlap type of look or sort of have the right that's corner cusp in the middle? Yeah. We will, we will show you, that's, a, that's extremely important. Since we want to 
implant the valve, or we can implant the valve in an anatomically correct position, we will do some uh, sweeps of the C-arm to make sure that the locators are in the corresponding cast. We will, I will, we will show you in a minute. So by out of the tish. Yes. Okay, perhaps we can have the camera here on, um, on the sheath to my hands. What you can see here, I'm not sure whether... Yeah, there you go. Okay. What you can see here, these are the tips of the locators, and they look, they are outside uh, the, the covering system. So um, this is going to be critical that you be uh, very gently in inserting this. Yeah, okay. No, this was. Look at this. There you mm -hmm. go. Okay, Good. So Oof. Then, it, yeah. Oh, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was part. just for you to get the tension a little bit more. Up, draht vor. All right, and I'll, while we do this, I go a little bit more LAO so that we can see the arch a little better. And then just so pause he, there at for this, a second. Yeah, at this position, you want to look whether everything's fine. And so what we see, Stefan, is the three locators, right? Um, one, two, three. And also we have good sleeve coverage on the distal end. So do you think it's look, it looks good? I think it's okay. Huh? Yeah, it's okay. Right. right. So the three locators sit in the in the sinuses, and by that they have a natural uh, alignment, commercial alignment. Exactly. exactly. I'll give you a little puff so that you can guys can yeah, see. Hold on one second. Yeah. I... Okay, I guess we are a little bit deep. Mm -hmm. li We're in LAO though, so I go back to. The two, yes. Okay, we go a little bit mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And I give you one zoom. Okay. So you know what I do? We we'll, we'll do an injection here uh -huh. so that everybody can see where we are actually. Looks good. Perfect, yeah. That's good. Very good to see now. So we we aligned everything at the SCJ. So so what we do now is we will expose the locators by retracting the sheath. These little arms, correct? Yeah, exactly. That's spread out. So here you can see. And the sheath is going to be removed into the descent. Okay, now you can see it. These little tips, the arms that are coming out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what is next, Mati? So now we're going to center the system a little bit by giving flex with that um, button here. So I'll, um, I'll give a little flex and then you see the locators will start to separate a little bit more and uh, it, the valve should move a little bit more in a curvature. You might see this now. There you go. There you go, see? So it spreads out a little bit more. Yeah, so they're spreading out more and there are three now. Exactly, so it looks actually pretty nice already. So we yeah. have a three cast view and so we have one on the left, one in the middle and one on the right. And the one in the middle, we just want to make sure if that one is anterior or posterior. Mm -hmm. Right, to do so, we will do a C-arm sweep. The question is whether we, before we do so, we will liberate the valve a little bit from mm -hmm from the catheter. Mati is doing this right now, so that we have more maneuverability. Yeah, you can nicely see. Perfect, very good, all right. Okay, now we have to check that we are correct with our position. So if I may just say the right and the left locators are okay. But now the question is, the middle, as uh, uh, Stefan said, is this anterior or posterior? That's really the only question now. Absolutely. 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 So while Stefan hits the, the pedal, I'm just going to swipe from LAO to RAO. And as you can appreciate, the middle locator moved towards the left cusp yeah, locator. Okay. We can show this Can again. you show this? Uh, I didn't see 
You can otherwise do this yeah. again. That should be it. You see the left locator yeah. stays basically where it is and the non moves to the left. Which means by definition if we move from LAO to RAO that it must be in front. Okay. So we're good. We are good. So, I, I, you know, let me just yeah. say this because it was a little fast for these guys here. What, what he did was he located the, the middle locator posterior anterior by sweeping it you could see it move to the left which means this middle locator is in the anterior position so they're all good to go correct me if i'm wrong That's Ex exactly explained it's the the right cusp the right cusp is anterior and by this maneuver we can define that our locator in the middle of the system is indeed anterior and thereby corresponding to the right cusp. Question to you both. If that would be posterior, what would you do? We would turn the system. How would we do this, Mati? Well, I can show you. I mean, I, I'm not going to turn it now because we're in a perfect position. Okay, okay. You could say, unfortunately, Rohat. Otherwise, I could... No, no, no. Go it. ahead. We can explain um, it later. But, um, no, if, if you show my hands here. So what I did to uh, separate the ferrule and the delivery system a little bit is I pressed these two blue buttons and then it advanced it a little bit. What we can also do, and I just like a little bit do this here, so can you, can, we can appreciate that it turns here. Yep. And this mechanism will uh, enable us to turn the valve itself in the STJ. So we always have to make sure that you're not entangled in the anatomy, of course, but once, you, once you're a little bit above the STJ in the sinuses, you can turn the valve. Okay, so basically, so we are they turn. anatomically correct. So now we can advance the system, the valve, into wanna, the yeah. sinuses. Want right? to pull wire a little, or should I advance? I'll go ahead. So you obviously want so to be in a three cusp view with the one in the middle is the right cu right cusp, yeah. so that when you have right. to sit down into okay. the right, and one is to the left, and the other one is to the non. Okay, no, and and this we can now check at least with uh, the multi-purpose catheter. So this is left, looks reasonable. Mm -hmm. And you see also that the left locator is spreading out now. You see it flares up a little bit. So Good. it definitely has contact with the left. Yeah, we look and for then also we saw the contrast filling the left cusp pretty well okay. and seeing that locator. Yeah. And now we go non, perfect. So I see you use a multi-purpose much better than using a pigtail because you can go different yeah. places very right. easily, right? Exactly. So rather exactly. than pigtail, sometimes you couldn't really do much okay. with it. And, and the, the perhaps even more important point is that you don't want to have an entanglement with your yeah, locators. Yeah, and, yeah. and this is, uh, yeah. so yeah, you can see idea. here nice aconary uh, contrast again. Looks good as well. Yeah. That's right. Should I move a little bit? Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's perfect. So, Stefan, if you go yeah. left, I just go for an aria caudal, which in this case, it's not a, a cusp overlap, but it isolates a little bit more. I go more caudal. Okay. The okay. right coronary cusp overlap. You can see this now, right? And if you give contrast now, you'll see that this locator is in the right yeah. cusp. Yeah, right? very nice. Okay, now we have also, to show you, we have also TOE in place so that we can try to locate and visualize the locators by TOE also. So Dr. Kerber, would you mind? Isabel, would you mind? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'm sweeping in place now. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, there we are. This is our home view, as I call it sometimes. And we can appreciate, so this would be the right cusp. We can appreciate here, this is the locator. I hope you can see my cursor here. Very well. Here. Perfect. So we can appreciate it's very clearly in the middle of the cusp. We can see it also clearly here in the eight coronary. And to be honest, it's quite, it it's is. always a little difficult to see it here because of the shadow of the yep. system. But so in this cusp, it's a little more difficult to see it very clearly. But the okay. other ones we can but see But you have an idea, well. yeah. So we'll try to sweep a bit. Is this routinely done in our TE? No. Oh, just for you. No, I... Ah, there it is. You can see it now. Do you see it? Yeah. yeah. Here. Very Here. Nice. So, yeah. Okay. I'm very Just for happy. fun. Thank you very much. That's nice. Okay. Okay. Can you remove these? Yes, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. All right. So we'll, we'll do another injection to see whether we are uh, okay with respect to height. 
And I think this is the case. We, we do not want to press too hard since we have aortic regurgitation. We can talk about this perhaps in a minute. But then I would say we are ready to go yeah, for implantation. Like okay. So Good luck. we need fast pacing now. Thank you. So I removed the security clip here. 140. And then it's just a turn and push mechanism at the end of the system here. Okay. Keep the pressure on the system. Everybody's happy, yes, right? There's no, not, not yet. Pacing is not on. Fast pace. Yes, please. So pacing is on with 120 just to stabilize everything. So I release that one, huh? Okay, off we go. Okay. Turn, push, and go. Release. Okay, now what is important is we are pacing not done yet. done yet. We have to carefully remove the system to not entangle something in the valve. Yeah, pull it out. So yeah. I'll take the flex of the system a little push on nice. the Nice. Okay. And then stop before you move. Give me one sec, guys. I'll help you here. I know Asan, yeah. Asan's medical center would like to implant a valve very quick, but this is faster than any <laughs> yeah. of, uh, of you guys can uh, can inflate yes. here. <laughs> Fast pacing can be off. <laughs> very nice. Okay. Okay, now we... Um, she, she comes back a little bit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> And to, to answer the question, um, because you spoke about fast delivery, I mean, we're not routinely doing TO. Usually 80-90% of our patients are in, what? are in conscious sedation, right? So yeah. we would not do TOE. Um, we we certainly lot, appreciate the extra effort. Okay. <laughs> it's Isabel effort, Eberhard. So. Yep. And it's good to hear female voice, too. <laughs> Always. Always, yes. That's right. So we'll... I'll give it a little push down here. There you go. So, Stefan, can okay. I ask you a question? So when you introduce sure. the catheter into the sheath, um, and if you have the three uh, locators put in a certain way, it most likely to come out will be correct, not upside, not backwards for anterior posterior mis mismatch, yeah. right? Right. So it should, it's exactly. unlikely that will be like in the back, but off a little bit, but not yeah. off the way back. Yeah, it, it, it happens, happens more often than you would anticipate. Mm. The, in, in general, yes, more than 50% are, are correct uh, in the place. Stefan, okay. I, I'm, I'm HSK from Seoul. Can I ask you a question regarding the structural uh, component of the Jena valve? Usually the patient has a really few rare classification. Thus, I think, uh, what's the mechanism play a role to, uh, fixate, to fix the st structure and non classified our analysts. We understand so locator may be a, a kind of system to prevent prolapse of valve into left ventricle. What is the uh, mechanism to prevent distal embolization of the valve? Yeah, it's, it's a very important question. It's, it's simply the clipping mechanism. So it's not related and not relying on the fact that uh, there is radial strength. Uh, so it's just uh, the clipping mechanism. That's why you have to be so uh, careful in um, getting uh, all casts uh, covered uh, with, the, um, with the locators. Here we have a little, apparently a little problem yeah. in getting so, uh, so the system. So if I may explain, the, <clears throat> the valve has not only the three locators, but they have kind of claspers, mm -hmm. like clips, mm -hmm. and they clip this, the leaflets between the, the, um, the, 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 the design, I mean the stent, if you wish, and the night knoll, and these, these clips. Mm -hmm. So they secure, it's a natural sealing, actually. They don't need any, any skirt. But uh, native valve leaflet is not so strong. No. Well, no, it's, it's Even though correct. the valve uh, clipped, the uh, yeah. native valve, but it may be insufficient to prevent destabilization of the valve. Is the expansive force weak? Mm -hmm. So it is not sufficient to fix the system in the endless? Yeah, I mean, I could, they're, they're concentrating there, but, okay. but maybe Mati, you can also talk about aortic stenosis because um, while you're doing this, I, I talked to Professor Kim here. Um, we have done the first result because in, in Europe it's approved for AS and AR. Mm -hmm. So we're doing almost okay. half half cases now half uh, stenosis, half um, regurgitation. Yeah. And 
Uh, are you ready to talk, Matti, or are you still concentrating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, trying to do both, which sometimes works well, sometimes not so much. But perhaps, I think yeah. Um, perhaps we can already show some echo data, if you, if you don't mind. No, yeah, we don't. You can see my... <laughs> <laughs> we want to see the result, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see it here in the biplane view that the valve on the right side is sitting in here very nicely. Yep. And um, as I turn color on, we can also appreciate that we have only maybe trace PVL, but maybe it's also the catheter is still in, but definitely no signs of... Yeah great regurgitation, paravalvular or anything. Well, so it looks now. very so good. Central leakage should disappear. Okay. Uh, are you guys so agreeing? Can... Yeah. It's trivial. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, so. Very nice. Do Wonderful. You think? Yeah. yeah, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks good. So, Matti or, or Stefan, could you uh, briefly uh, talk to uh, Professor Kim about the stenosis part? Well, yeah, I mean, there have been trials and trials are ongoing on, on both etiologies, on a pure aortic regurgitation as well as uh, on patients with aortic stenosis. And the fact that you are able to position this valve in an anatomically correct way, um, um, the, the fact that you have no stress on the on the annulus, but, but rather fixate the valve by clipping uh, the valve, which may reduce um, uh, pacemaker need in patients with aortic stenosis, may make this valve also a very attractive choice, in, in our view, for patients with aortic stenosis. Not the heavily calcified, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. But uh, Would you do an angiogram too? We, we will do, yeah. We will prepare this right now. Can you post dilate yeah, this it. if you have yeah, aortic you. stenosis and there is, you know, this self-expanding portion is not pushing the valve enough? Do you, do you need to post dilate? Does it matter? But you can. You can, right? Yeah. You could, yeah. In our experience, it's not that much necessary. We would, we would be very, as I said, very liberal in doing this prior to implantation. Um, but usually post dilatation is... So, so you leave the you leave the uh, the 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 pigtail in the LV, right? Well, I, I think we remove it now so that we have uh, that we have final conditions. Okay. Uh, Gerald, are you are you seeing it in Australia? Yeah, was it asked? Presumably, this also protects against a uh, you know current occlusion if you're basically clipping the leaflets and B ensures. Uh, Coronary reaccess in the future with uh, always commercial alignment. Yeah. And here you can also see, Dr. Kim, how large the cells are for coronary access. Mm -hmm. You know? Is there echoes on the Yeah. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. This is contrast, no? It's pretty similar okay. to artery. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So we'll have an angle for you in a second. Beautiful. Very nice. Yeah. I think it looks good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it looks okay. really nice. It looks very, very nice. So, uh, guys, that was a brilliant performance. Thank you so much. I don't know. Do we have time? Uh, what is the situation here? Couple minutes, yeah. We have a couple of minutes. Any any questions to the team there? First of all, thank you very much. Um, it's it's a great performance, and you explained uh, the steps very nicely. It was obviously a very good result. Actually, I, I don't want to be too 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 fancy, but basically that's the result that we expect with this valve. Correct? At least for the yeah, most part. Absolutely. In particular, in patients with pure AR, you yeah. You should see this, yes. yes. Any questions from, from the panel? Yeah, can I ask a question? What is the pace, pacemaker rate again, sorry, for the for AS? Is there any, because the, the self, the valve part of it is actually not touching the the septum, if you may, yeah. right? Because it's kind of hanging but, in, in there, so, so. But this is an extremely important point. So in AS, the pacemaker rate is below 5%. Mm -hmm. However, in patients with pure AR, 
uh, it's, it's higher. It's, yeah. it's uh, above 10 percent. In our case, we have uh, we have no pacemaker need. Right. And we think that the depth of implantation is obviously driving the need for pacemaker implantation. So the the, the, the lack of calcium, if you want to say so, probably um, lowers uh, the seating of the valve, and and this. Uh, um, uh, yeah, makes it a little bit more likely that you have uh, yeah. a need for pacemakers. This is something we have to be um, aware of, and that's why you shouldn't push too hard once you're implanting the valve, so that that seating of the valve in, in an AR case is not getting too low. But it seems like if you have uh, a thick leaflet, that the valve part is actually a little smaller, so it's not touching the wall, versus a very thin leaflet for AI. AI then essentially yeah. there's no yeah. space between the two clip, the two clip, right? The locator and the inside. And therefore the, the, the bottom part is a little bit bigger, if you may, and maybe yeah. touching the wall and therefore causing pacemaker. Right, right, exactly. Uh, Steph any, any, any question? Uh, uh, Stefan, I'm Dr. Kang from Seoul. Uh, I have a question that this the, is the general valve can be applied to the patient with AR with Prolapsed valve or anorectasia? Is it possible? Yeah. So the anatomic uh, conditions and, and prerequisites are quite narrow. We, we, are, we, are, we are looking at the steepness of the arch. We are looking uh, at in, indeed also the, the, the extent of dilatation of uh, the ascending aorta. We did some patients with with uh, aortic aneurysms, uh, which can be done, but this is uh, outside um, the, 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 the current uh, clear indication. So we have to be a little bit careful here that we are able, and this is most important, that we are able to maneuver the valve into the position and being able to, to locate the locators in, in, in the cusps. Um, and, and therefore, um, with the current system at least, um, we need some prerequisites with respect to the anatomic uh, uh, situation. Perfect. So I think it's five o'clock our time. Thank you so much for this uh, performance. Um, I'm very proud of you actually here. I can say this among friends. <laughs> And, uh, and it, it, it's a brilliant result. And the one behind the, uh, the curtain there, the two, uh, thank you very much for, for, for having beautiful echo images. The patient is fully asleep, I guess, for the live transmission. So thank you very much uh, for the performance and give them a big hand. It was a pleasure for us. Goodbye. Thank bye, you very guys. much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so um, now we are switching to the Kerkhoff Clinic. Hello, can you hear us? Hello, Professor Gruber. Hi, how are you? Oh, how are you? <laughs> very how are you good. <laughs> you want to speak Korean? A uh, little bit, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, so as you know, um, uh, here for at least for the foreigners, everyone is Dr. Park and Dr. Kim. Yeah, um, me also. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and here next to me is Professor Kim. Yeah. So uh, thank you for for having us, and we're looking very much forward to being with you um, for a, an interesting case. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And of course, it's a very exciting thing, especially for me, uh, as I'm native Korean and uh, from South Korea, not from North Korea, <laughs> as you can see. And um, yeah, I would like to shortly introduce my colleagues, which uh, will, um, we will do the case together. Next to my side is uh, Dr. Charitos. He's a cardiac surgeon. You should know him, Professor Grube von Bonn, from Bonn. Um, Matthias Renka will support us. He will also make the case introduction and Janine will uh, also help us uh, at the table. And um, yeah, maybe we should start with the case presentation. Um, could we just see the slides? Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction. Welcome also from my side to Bad Nauheim. We have the case summary. We have an 81-year-old male patient with severe symptomatic low-flow, low-gradient aortic stenosis. He's high operative risk um, patient um, with the Euroscore presented here. He has severely reduced um, LV function and previous cabbage with patent grafts. 
So his history includes previous MI, PCI, and cabbage, as I said. Also, he had done carotid surgery in the past, and um, he suffers from AFib, and there is a pre-existing right bundle branch block. Um, he clinically presents to us with um, dyspnea on exertion, being um, near heart association class three, um, and stable angina. We have performed non-invasive um, diagnostic studies including echo and uh, CT, which we will show on the next slides. Um, we, will, um, we plan to treat aortic stenosis with an accurate NEO2 size M, meaning 25 millimeter, and um, this with um, transfemoral access routes, we will pre-delate with um, 20, 22 millimeter balloon, and medication includes um, aspirin and heparin. Next. Here we can appreciate the echo with um, severely reduced um, e ejection fraction of 35% approximately. The mean um, gradient of the aortic valve was 21 millimeters of mercury with an um, aortic valve area of 0.6 square centimeter. Next slide. Here we can see the coronary angio of the native uh, coronaries with a three vessel disease. Next slide. And the patent bypass grafts, the Lima on the left side, approaching the LAD. Then the venous graft approaching the marginal and diagonal branch with a jump. And the venous graft on the right side is seen to approach the right coronary artery. Computed tomography showed us that um, the parameter derived um, analyst diameter was 23.4 millimeters. The left and right coronary arteries um, have an offspring of uh, slightly above 13 and 15 millimeters above the annulus plane, respectively. We have um, the predicted, the CT predicted um, three cusp view on the far right upper side and the th cusp overlap view um, below that. And um, corner, uh, the calcium score of the uh, aortic valve was 1,397 Agatson units. And the peripheral angio is showed in the center uh, with 7.7, um, approximately minimal diameter of 7.7 .7 millimeters on the, um, on the femoral artery, the common one. Next slide. So these are the teaching points. Transfemoral TAVI with a minimalist approach according to the SLIM protocol, which was um, published by Dr. Kim in International Journal of Cardiology in last year. We have an ultrasound guided puncture, which we would like to show you. A single proglide is aimed for a single arterial access. We would um, like to show low contrast usage um, using a J-wire as the marker um, um, in the non-coronary cusp. And um, we approach commercial alignment and we would like to implant uh, in the cusp overlap view, which however is not recommended by the manufacturer. And finally, verification of um, the integrity of the vasculature is performed using ultrasound again at the end. Thank okay. you very much. Matthias, thank you very much for the excellent introduction. Stratos, you as cardiac surgeon, uh, any discussion regarding the indication for uh, I think this the, approach? The indication is quite clear. This okay. uh, uh, not a surgical uh, patient anymore yeah. with patent grafts and uh, also due to this age. So um, I think the TAVI procedure is the right um, uh, therapy for this patient. Yes, okay, thank you. Any questions regarding this quest, uh, patient uh, um, uh, from the panel? Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much uh, to all of you. Uh, we have a very good idea about the case. Interesting, as you probably know or already know, that in South Korea, the, the device is being approved and is being used uh, or very close to being used. Um, so you will see your, your, your home country a little bit more often in the future, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, just one question, you know, because since you're mentioning it, 
um, the uh, cusp overlap not recommended by the by the manufacturer what exactly does that mean yeah the current recommendation and it has been traditionally implanted in the three cusp view and um, this is how we learned it and yeah. um, there were a lot of questions because you know other self-expanding platforms and also even um, balloon expandable pl platforms are more and more being implanted in the cus OLED view mm -hmm. and we've seen a reduction of pacemaker implantation rate and this is why we started to do it and um, we will see about the results in the future um, so I far see. there's no signal that it's um, it's better or worse and I yeah. think probably the accurate a platform can be implanted um, in the three cast view without um, uh, any problems also yeah. in the future but we will find out yeah so um, I don't know I mean any more questions please chime in yeah Dr. Uh, Kim. Uh, I'm HS Kim from Messenger Hospital uh, it's wonderful to meet you Dr. Wong and Kim and I think the rationale for us to adopt cusp of that view is to make the marker band uh, avalet as a single line without disturbing the single line of the endless plane. Thus, we can actually deploy and achieve the shallow implantation. Is there any such kind of uh, marker band in accurate system also? Yeah, actually, you cannot compare this with the accurate because the positioning, the uh, principle of deployment is completely different. Uh, we have a top-down deployment, and with the Evolute, uh, we have a, um, um, a deployment from, from the bottom. So the, the, you, you cannot actually um, compare these two kinds of um, um, valve platforms. And we have found, and maybe you will see later on, that in the CUS overlap view, Actually, actually, the device, the final implantation depth, looks higher than in the uh, three cast view. We we have analyzed it, um, so we, we need, but we need further um, analysis to find out about the clinical meaning in terms of using the accurate neo, uh, using this approach. Okay, just another question: How many, you know, the sizes? Give us an idea yeah. on what sizes you have. So the accurate neo is available in three sizes, in S, M, and L, and covers, officially covers an annular range between 21 and 27 millimeter. Our experience in the past few years has shown that probably um, a little bit more oversizing is beneficial for the outcomes, and um, these processes can cover um, um, more favorably the lower uh, the, the smaller sizes. So um, annular size 90 millimeter to 20 is no problem. We would um, not recommend Im implanting this device in um, annular sizes exceeding 26.5, 26.6, because then the degree, the amount of oversizing probably is not sufficient. I see. Any, any other comments? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm Warrit, come from Thailand. Uh, in the patient with post bypass, the height of vein graft is concerned on this ten from the last. Is any concern for an accurate new valve? Pardon the. In, uh, in, an, in an accurate new valve, uh, this yeah. ten from the vein graft to the annulus is can, can concern uh, any concern about this. No, not at all, because um, the stabilization arches uh, there is not much material. And also the total length is um, below five centimeters. So I would not expect any interaction with the bypass grafts. Okay, any other question? No, okay, so. <laughs> okay, so Ready to go. maybe a sh short introduction to our setup. Um, as we have sh uh, um, 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 shown you, we will use one single arterial axis. I, I, I would like to show demonstrate the puncture from the beginning. We have already inserted a venous line, which serves uh, as a substitute for a uh, central venous line, which uh, we don't use anymore. And uh, we have already inserted the temporary pacemaker. And now uh, we will start to do the puncture. I will show you the ultrasound images. I mean, uh, this is nothing new. We can see the vasculature very nicely. We can see um, other than on CT, that there, there are plaques, um, but in the, um, in the um, 
uh, at the vessel wall, uh, at the um, um, back vessel wall, so for the puncture is no problem. And you may appreciate, which I think is uh, very important, um, I will try to improve the quality of the image. It, so you can see the femoral artery nicely. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, so you, you can see the um, uh, Doppler signal and mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can also appreciate um, downwards the, the, the femoral head. So this will be a landmark of the puncture head. And um, we also do a Doppler um, analysis. Uh, and this will be of help for verifying the vascular integrity. So we have a biphasic flow pattern mm -hmm. now, and we will check later on. So for the puncture, we have already applied local anesthesia and we try to find a good spot, of course, not too high. Is this your regular approach with ultrasound, ultrasound guided? Yes. Mm -hmm. Kannst du noch mal spülen, bitte? Okay, I was a little bit too deep. I, I, think so I was not able to advance the wire. I think this is but a this, wonderful this case sometimes. for accurate because the patient has our BBB. And the previous clinical trial data, the pacemaker implantation rate of accurate is really lower than Sapien or Avalut. Second, the patient has a LV dysfunction. Uh, there is no need for a rapid pacing in the accurate system. Mm -hmm. Thus, I think that's an important uh, merit for accurate. The third is uh, the patient has a previous cabbage and vein graft is from the uh, ascending artery to coronary artery. Thus, it may require a future okay, coronary no accessibility. In that case, uh, the accurate system is wide cell size in the uh, proximal part, thus it is very easy for coronary access. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you have very nicely summarized the uh, um, features of the accurate NEO. So we know that the limitations of the first generation has been the um, lower opening force. So there was a higher rate of PVL in the scope one and two study. Also the accurate NEO is um, um, quite uh, sensitive to um, sizing errors and um, a proper um, and the proper positioning is very important, but um, beyond that, if you are able to uh, address this, then you will benefit from the advantages that this uh, platform provides. So now I will check the correct position. Can you a bit of water, please? So you can see that the wire nicely travels into the vessel, almost in an orthogonal fashion. And also here on the side view, we see that um, we are in the femoral artery. So I would be satisfied with the position. 
And you may not have noticed because the CT images look actually very nice. Can you show my scalpel, bitte? But there is a quite an amount of uh, calcium, so it's um, might be a little bit difficult also to deploy the proglide system. And it's important to prepare it. So using one proglide, correct? Yes. Yeah. This is our default approach. We have found that uh, very frequently. I know um, what is what is your experience. Very frequently, um, the second proglide, especially if we do it um, the old way and um, inserting it at 10 and 2 o'clock, the second one that we, um, the second knot, uh, knot was not effective. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I don't know. Uh, and uh, I think that um, uh, putting one probe light at 12 o'clock makes it uh, much more effective. This is, yeah, this in is case, our experience. Yeah, in case you have oozing or blood, you, you compress or using angel seal, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is actually very frequently the, uh, frequently the case that we have um, oozing or residual bleeding. And then I think also the combination between one proglide and one angel seal uh, makes, is very effective and might be also increase the safety. We have not analyzed it yet, but um, it was a gut feeling. Jetzt drückst du mal, Herr Schnitzer. So now we insert uh, the 11 French sheath we have a long um, regular arterial wire here. We can then the rest heparin, geben, bitte. Now we will administer heparin. So you're maintaining an ACT 250, basically? 250 plus minus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we müssen in Kaudal gehen. Yeah, so now... So what you can see now, hopefully, maybe the camera can zoom in. We have the 11 French sheath in the main artery or in the uh, only artery. We have a regular J wire inserted here also in the uh, long J wire, which we, we use over in uh, Amplat's left catheter for, wire, um, for valve crossing. And this, we mentioned it in the presentation, will be used, this wire will be used only as a landmark throughout the entire procedure. And we will start with fluoro. You can see that the temporary pacemaker is in place already. Mm -hmm. And now I'm moving and uh, advancing the J wire, the analysis, the ana anatomy is relatively small. And uh, all I do is placing it in the, oh, I already passed to the valve. Good, 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 excellent. So, Now this is our landmark. Bitte eine Lupe rein. And uh, you're planning what valve size? The valve size that we planned for is 20, 25. So the analyst was 23. Okay, then. So it's medium? Yeah, and this would be medium. Yeah, yeah. And now you can see I have slight problems to advance the wire into, now it's safely in the non-coronary wire um, cusp. And the other wire I would insert, um, use as, uh, okay, that's my speichern. Now you can see that uh, the other wire is in the left coronary cusp. And, um, and now it's in the right coronary cusp. And you can extrapolate the three wire positions and assume that we are, we have a good um, three cusp view. Yeah. And now we have passed the um, aortic valve. We will later on verify this with um, a aortic root shot just for you to demonstrate. Usually we do not um, do aortic root shots to verify the um, cusp view because uh, we think that even though you have maybe five degree um, deviation, I don't think it um, 
it majorly affects the implantation plane. So now you have seen we have passed the aortic valve with the long J wire. So as we do not use a straight wire, there is no need to exchange it. We can directly uh, go uh, inside the left ventricle with the pigtail catheter. So, and you can also appreciate the J wire just stays in the nadir of the non-coronary cusp and serves as a landmark. Can I please have a J-wire and a pigtail? So now we insert, the, this is what we did not mention, the safari wire. We predominantly use size S in smaller persons. Uh, sometimes the XS is um, Useful. Okay, um, you know, that's on my piggy. Yeah, a quick angio, 10 10. Herr Schnitzer, yeah. geht das mit den Schmerzen? Yeah. Okay, good. You can see, we, uh, we actually, we recently started to do the cases uh, only in local anesthesia. So we try to avoid even anergo sedation. And the rationale behind this is that um, patients might be, um, so uh, they can tell when they have pain. And um, this might also increase the hemodynamic stability. Sometimes patients wear sedated very deeply and um, so okay kannst du ein bisschen zentrieren nee auf die auf die genau so was ist los actually you don't need contrast to see the pigtail and the wires yeah <laughs> yeah, this is only for you to demonstrate that uh, we have a good no, no, I, recast view. Yeah, yeah. And usually we do not perform this step if we feel safe about the correct position of the, of the wire and also of the implantation plane. So now we withdraw the 11th French sheath. And now please, uh, maybe you can show the groin a little bit closer. Now we will insert the eye sleeve, which is the standard sheath, 14 French, in a diameter at the tip. Ah, can I have a compressor, please? Can you hold it hinten? So there's some resistance. Now it was... Um, so... Herr Schnitzer, jetzt kannst du mal ein bisschen drücken in der Leiste. I think one other advantage of having the patient completely awake is that they can tell me when there's pain in the groin. So usually you can see, you can see that um, the uh, sheath, I have not inserted the sheath completely into the patient. Uh, uh, the patient is also very, very uh, skinny. And um, usually if I... Uh, proceed to insert the sheath, a patient has a uh, pain, and it's only a gut feeling, but uh, the, the rate of dissections is increased. So I could stop immediately when the patients have pain, or I'm, I would be a little bit more careful. And please appreciate um, the setup. Um, the wire that is placed in the non-coronary cusp is still in the, um, in the artery, but has been externalized. And um, so uh, does not decrease the lumen of the sheath. So now we are ready for the pre-dilatation. We use a regular 22 semi-compliant or compliant balloon. Yeah, okay, ein loop rein, bitte. You can see the balloon position. Carsten, genau, rapid pacing vorbereiten, bitte. Mit 200. Herr Schnitzer. 
Jetzt kann es sein, dass es Ihnen etwas schwindelig wird, ja? Okay, gut, bereit? Okay, Rapid Pacing an. Okay, mhm. okay gut. Und Rapid Pacing aus. Okay. So, um, for actuate, uh, um, is, the, is the balloon pre-dilatation mandatory or is this it's case mandatory. by case? And uh, for, okay, Pacen, bitte. Yeah, you can see on the monitor that the patient uh, had asystole and this is uh, probably due to his pre-existing right bundle branch block. This is why we will keep the temporary pacemaker. So even though we use the accurate, there is of course an increased risk of um, conduction disturbances. Okay, so I will just change gloves. No, okay. So now for commercial alignment, it is important to insert the delivery system. The patient is stable, as you can see, and also a sinus rhythm has recovered. To insert the system with uh, the flush port at six o'clock, this increases the likelihood, of course, does not guarantee, but increases the likelihood of um, uh, um, pre-existing commercial alignment. Now we pass the aortic arch which is relatively small. We have a very small patient, actually. <laughs> so now we check the commercial alignment, looking at the three commercial tabs. And we think we, um, it, we have um, roughly uh, commercial alignment. We will check in the CAS overlap view, mal in 33 gehen, RO 33. Yeah, okay. Now you see uh, that uh, in the cast overlap view, we have a 2-1 configuration. This would be too complicated to explain it. Uh, but um, this indicates actually that we have commercial alignment. Yeah. Now we go back to the implantation view. The patient is still hemodynamically stable. Okay. Now you can see that uh, the accurate NEO2, other than the, its predecessor, has a dedicated marker. Ben, eine Lupe rein, bitte. Yeah. Okay. Be and now, before you, you can before, see. Yeah. Uh, Herr okay, Kim, before Sie, before Sie freisetzen, uh, mm -hmm. können Sie uns sagen, um, was Sie gleich sehen werden, damit das Publikum hier um, weiß, worauf Sie zu achten haben? Okay, ja. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Professor Gruber asked for... Um, oh, I'm uh, sorry, Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> providing sorry details. About that. Uh, well, no. It's, no, it's no problem, I can translate. No, no I know. Uh, but I, I think we have to hurry up because you can see that the blood pressure... I got pressure carried is away, sorry about that. Uh, and um, können wir bitte mal fast pacing machen? I assume that there is some aortic regurgitation. We, will, uh, we have to do it a little bit faster, okay? We will start with step one, where we'll see the upper crown opening. Yeah. And then now the upper crown opens, and then the stabilization arches. Okay, we must not beeilen. Okay, now. Yeah, mm. why is collapsed? The draht is rein, reingerutscht, ne? Okay, I think we have to go to. Um, hmm? Deep yeah. position the okay, wire. Bist du fertig? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think the wire has dislodged a little bit, but the patient is stable enough. Um, can I mal Einfühl haben, bitte? I think that the fast pacing really helps to um, stabilize the patient. Sometimes this happens, especially in small anatomies. So I would prefer try to reposition the wire. Might not be able, but. We have lost position anyways. Nee, nee, ich glaube, das ist okay. Ja. Hm? Nee, nee, alles gut. Ja, weil 
go deaf. Yeah, I think this is related to the small anatomy, but actually it's no problem because we can still see the calcification. So, okay. Kann ich nochmal die Szene davor sehen, bitte? Nee, davor. Hmm. The valve didn't move, right? No, the valve didn't move, so yeah. I, I assume that the position is good. Yeah, yeah. Kann ich nochmal die uh, Implantation, uh, die, um, die Angio sehen, bitte? Yeah. Davor. Okay, yeah. Uh, so we know, can we can use the native calcification as orientation or, or the and, wire um, the surgical wire no yeah no wire <laughs> no 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 i mean from the sternotomy oh okay yeah that's right yeah okay and we will just release the valve okay yeah yeah so remember this is okay so this is an <laughs> okay the wire um the the valve is in yeah, we and can see now that. We will retrieve no heart rate. <laughs> the system. Okay, can we pacen? I think it's just temporarily. So we retrieve the system, which uh, has been very easy. We close knob one and two, and now can retrieve the system. And you can see that the patient has been completely stable. So it's a it's a it's a forward motion when 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 you saw the rapid um, the the turn of the of the wheel um, yeah. then you have to do it quick and there's a slight forward push uh, of the valve correct yeah th this is correct and you you need a first operator it's extremely important to maintain a slight forward pressure not active push because actively pushing might um, might lead to um, um, the too problem. aggressive. Yeah, might lead to embolization into the left ventricle. Yeah, we don't and want that. This is, yeah, we wouldn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can see um, that uh, we try to maintain the single arterial axis because we are very afraid of arterial axis, as you can see, and. Uh, We'll make use of the of the sufficient space we have in the sheath. Uh, I guess and using your minimalist, minimalistic approach, uh, yes. do we have echo in the room or no? Yeah, yeah, we have echo in the room. Yeah, just in case, no? Yes, yes. So now we have punctured the hemostatic valve. Um, at the rim of the hemostatic valve and um, I don't like to insert it uh, in the center of the hemostatic valve because there's more side bleeding and now we can insert um, let me just check whether I can position the wire on the hand side no uh, sometimes it's possible to place the wire uh, but uh, the, the anatomy is too small. And um, you, you have noticed that we didn't perform hemodynamic measurement before. Uh, this is not our standard, but um, we do uh, measure hemodynamics afterwards because uh, it is our goal to really eliminate any gradient that we see here on the table. Because um, our experience is seeing any gradient on the table with yeah. increases the risk of um, a mismatch later on. Okay, so now we will zero. Can you um, see the hemodynamics? Okay. So, can you lower the backup uh, pacing rate? Yes, yes, yes. Können wir vielleicht auf 50 gehen, bitte? Yeah, I know, because, um, yeah, we'll go down to 50. Is it a complete AV block? Yeah, we will check. 
I mean, I would not wonder. You have seen how the patient reacted just upon um, valvuloplasty. Okay. It's still uh, pacemaker dependent. Can we go to 40? Sure. We go down to 40. You can see the measurements now. Yeah. Okay. So there is no gradient. Diastolic Wait pressure could be a little bit lower. Oh, the red we can hardly see. So. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I think the patient is, yeah, obviously completely pacemaker dependent now. Can we go to 35, please? Or does that not Yeah, it seems like a totally if we, if we block, um, we will have to check what to do. Sometimes we do immediate um, permanent pacemaker implantation, but actually with the accurate, um, the risk is relatively small compared to other valves. Yeah, but you started yeah, yeah, with the right bundle branch block, right? Yeah, pre-existing right bundle yeah, benchmark, yeah. so there was an in increased risk. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, now we will go to cuss overlap view. You can see that we almost achieved per perfect commercial alignment. Hmm. And um, this is being confirmed on the cuss overlap view, as you can see with the two commercial posts on the left-hand side overlapping and one on the right-hand side um, being isolated. So now we will do final angiogram. Okay, we use 20 cc of contrast agent with a flow of 20 seconds. Haben wir 15 Bilder? Okay. So, Herr Schnitzer, jetzt wird's mal warm im Postkorb. Genau. The correct positioning of the pigtail is extremely important because the leaflets are mounted in a very high position. So there's still some leak, which is quite unusual. I think we will check on echo because I think the position is very good. Why don't you remove the uh, picture catheter from the left ventricle? Yeah, I think this is an excellent idea. Can I mal? But as we all know, the uh, Achilles tendon of Achilles system is part of a leakage. Yes, exactly. But uh, I think with the Neo2, we have a lot of data now um, I think this has been addressed quite nicely and um, usually there is no, uh, the, the, uh, the rate of leak is very, has become very low. We will check on echo, however, if there is some time. Can, can I mal den Schalkoff haben, bitte? I mean, but in case there is, you do a post still, and uh, hopefully that's going to take care of it, right? Yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, with this small amount of calcification, um, I'd be surprised to find any more than mild um, PV leaks. So I will check on echo, because sometimes, indeed, the pictial catheter can cause artificial AR. And, uh, okay. I hope that we will have sufficient view, but this is our default approach. But it might be difficult to see good uh, image because the patient, uh, as I told you, is very um, skinny. And to be honest, the uh, quality of the image um, in supine position is um, not so convincing. No, not really. We could only see major 
leaks, which we um, wouldn't expect anyway. So you can see that the image quality is, uh, uh, is um, limited here. Um, yeah, I will try to obtain a parasternal view. So a question to the panel, uh, what, what would be your approach? Would you um, I would do another try to obtain? Shot. Yes, we will do it immediately. But yeah, yeah. So would you step ahead to TE or what, what would be your approach? Well, so then you on, on TTE, it's very difficult, as you can see. Mm -hmm. We will do another root shot. Yeah. Unless there's reno insufficiency, we rely on the root shots. Okay. Gehen wir mal in die um, 16, genau. Ja, in die erste. So, we will have another um, orientation, okay. Ja. Oh ja. Okay. okay. I see the problem. We are a little bit deep with the first valve on the left coronary side. So, Dr. Okay. Kim, you are the specialist. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, the possibility of supraannular uh, regurgitation is very low. So, yes. of course, it is uh, deeper than usual position, but there is less chance of supraannular regurgitation. It is a kind of parabella leakage. Would you leave it? Uh, the patient age is 81 years old. Uh, of course, uh, uh, he has a low ejection fraction. Thus, if we uh, reduce the leakage, it is better for him. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, do or not uh, to do the post-ballooning. Is there any problem in the post-ballooning in accurate system? No. No, no? Okay. not at all. So I would, uh, you, you, know, you know, the step would be now um, because the result is suboptimal. And you can see this was because of the suboptimal positioning. Indeed, we were too deep, and this wouldn't have happened if the wire hadn't dislodged. This is actually a very rare case, you can believe me. And um, what we would do now is um, try to um, have a better expansion of the stand by post-ballooning. And if this is not the case, then I think we would have to insert a second valve. There's, yeah. Jung Min. If yeah, there's time, you are. Um, go ahead. I, I, of course. I am Jung Min. I am Jung Min Nan from Asam Medical Center. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Or would uh, yeah, would thank you. Dale too. So, uh, in my visual est estimation, probably leakage is not that severe. So, the, can I see the pressure curve? Können wir nochmal die äh, Druckkurve? Ja, Können Sie die Pre Druckkurve nochmal ein, ein, einblenden? Ja, die Hemodynamik. 60, 60. So, yeah, 60. It's 2 plus, though. Ja, ich bin nicht der Minimalist. Ja. So, leave it alone a little bit. Uh, it is not perfect, but the acceptable range of PVL, so... So Leave it alone would be a good option. Where is the AR index here? I can see. Hard to kill. The question is, will um, ballooning seal that or not, or is it really not work because it's low? So, Ellen, uh, any, any comments from your side? I think I want to Pardon? evaluate the AI a little bit better, meaning that I, obviously the root shot shows that it is maybe significant, but at the same time, root shot is not the most accurate. So, you know, I don't know whether looking at the apical views from someone else who kind of look from the other side and get a better handle on obviously you are minimally invasive here so you don't have luxury of doing a TEE or anything like that so yes so no take a look at the pressure a bit more carefully and see what what is the hemodynamics significance here because that's yeah, really the what drives you hemodynamics right? is okay I don't think it's um, um, it's it's a mistake to do another um, postulation I think we can do this yeah, if there's no downside to and, ballooning, I would balloon. And we will try to 
Uh, another um, option is uh, if this doesn't work, that uh, but this would take somewhat longer time to try to snare the valve a little bit higher. Okay, this you know I would this might uh, work out. It, uh, because then you're getting into a little bit more of a. I, w I would try to post post balloon it and uh, hope yes, that this exactly. is going to be better. Yeah. So another important uh, thing to remember: Can you a bit more up zeigen, bitte? I think it is impossible to snare and pull because of the structure. Yeah. Good news is you can't be able to in one line, bring, bitte. You can. Mm. What, what size balloon do you use for this? Uh, we have a 22 millimeter balloon. Okay. Okay. Geh mal weiter nach LAO. Bisschen mehr noch. Okay. Now what um, I would like to demonstrate you is that after crossing the accurate, it's extremely, extremely important to verify that uh, we crossed oh, the stabilization arch through the right um, arch. And here I'm not so sure actually. Okay, Norman uh, Piggy, bitte. So if you have recrossed the accurate Neo, um, Centrally, there should be free movement of the wire um, to the left and to the right side of the uh, stand post that are overlapped on the left side. And currently, this is not, not really the case. So in order to... Ah, now you can see the, the, the wire didn't move, but the pigtail moves freely from the left to the right side, you can see. Ja, der war eben drüben, ne? oder? Hm? Nee. Ich meinte schon. Jetzt doch, oder? Eberhard, what is the uh, expanding power of uh, accurate NEO 2? Okay, no. then give me a J wire, bitte. So, to, based on the Everload I try, uh, time goes by, the Everload is expanding further. It's more than Jenna, obviously, but oh. it's the expansion force is not very high. Mm -hmm. So, the question uh, that you ask is uh, very important. So, um, the the radial force when as soon as the valve is completely expanded is not uh, so much less than that of the um, that of the evolute actually and um yeah time's up okay then give me my then just to give you uh, a little bit of a heads up as far as timing is concerned, yes, we are approaching, uh, uh, you know, the end. And um, if you could, um, we would try to make a, a short summary later on. Yeah, either that, and or of, if if we yeah. could still see the uh, the balloon, or you do the balloon peacefully, and then you let us know. Yes, I think this would be the best. Okay. Option right so now. we let you, yes. <coughs> we let you and the team work uh, on on making decisions. We will be discussing, and then um, and then we might come back. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Okay. For your patience. I mean, thank you. No, 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 no. Very you. nice. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Uh, <coughs> so let's move on to lectures. Um, so the first one is going to be given by David Cohen. Uh, he's going to talk about optimal indication for uh, cerebral protection, uh, embolic protection for TAVR insights from the TVT registry. David? Well, thank you very much, and thanks uh, to uh, the whole group from Asan for inviting me back here. It's really 
uh, fun to be back in, in, in Korea, and uh, I didn't even bring a boat um, uh, uh, for this. So uh, this is an interesting question. It's, it's interesting uh, partly because I think it's going to change a lot maybe in the next uh, month or two. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so I want to talk about three things in trying to understand, um, you know, when and in whom should we should be using embolic protection for TAVR. I want to talk about TAVR-related stroke and what the, you know, how big of an issue is it. I want to talk about the evidence that we have benefit with embolic protection. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about patient selection. So first of all, is TAVR-related stroke a problem? Uh, we saw some data here this morning from uh, um, Asan Medical Center that suggests it's a pretty minor nuisance uh, in, in their practice. Uh, but these are the data from the United States. Uh, uh, you can see over time, uh, the rate of in-hospital stroke is shown here in blue, and 30-day stroke is shown here in red. I, I, I don't think we need to pay quite as much attention to the one-year stroke, but you can see it's holding pretty steady right around, uh, uh, you know, one and a half to two percent in the hospital and a little over two percent uh, at 30 days. So we clearly have not eliminated, at least in the practice in the United States, uh, TAVR-related stroke. Uh, the reason why this is important is because TAVR-related stroke is still a very bad thing. Uh, this is data from uh, a Medicare study uh, uh, that the group at uh, Harvard put together, uh, looking at about 130,000 TAVR patients and looking at the longer-term outcomes. And you can see here, uh, in particular, uh, that there is still an increased risk of mortality at one year and at five years. And the cost excess cost of these TAVR-related strokes is about $9,000 per patient. So this is both a clinically and economically uh, serious matter. Um, and so that really leads us to the whole thing, to thinking about cerebral embolic protection devices. Uh, this is a list of, uh, at least a partial list of all the ones that I know about. The only one that's approved in the United States right now um, is the Sentinel device, uh, which I think, as many of you know, is uh, done by radial access through a six French sheath. It is approved. Uh, this is the device itself. So it's two uh, polyurethane filters that are inserted again through the right radial artery. One sits in the anominate, the other sits in the, in the left carotid, um, and the uh, uh, left vertebral is left uh, unprotected. Um, and we know uh, that in the pivotal U.S. trial that was designed uh, to support approval of this device with a primary endpoint of lesion uh, volume on MRI, uh, there was actually not a significant benefit of the Sentinel device, um, uh, despite, you know, again, designing the trial very well and conducting it very, very well. And so as a result, the Sentinel trial was interesting um, in that the device was approved in the United States not for prevention of stroke, not for, pre for reduction of uh, MRI lesions uh, in the brain, but for retrieving debris, um, which is the one thing that we have unequivocal evidence that it does. Um, it absolutely catches debris, and if you use it in your patients, you will see uh, debris that would have gone uh, someplace you, you, you don't like. Uh, so that's uh, at the approval in the United States currently. If we look at the randomized trials of embolic protection, this includes both Sentinel trials as well as some trials of some other devices that um, ought to work as well. Uh, you can see that the pooled relative risk for reduction in stroke um, is very close to one. Um, there isn't conclusive evidence from the randomized trials, although none of these trials individually or even in combination were large enough to really detect reductions in stroke. There are two major ongoing randomized trials, uh, one in the United States and one in the UK, uh, that are really designed to test this question. Uh, one is called Protected TAVR, the other is called the, the BHF Protect TAVI. This Protected TAVR trial, I'm pleased to uh, uh, report, is going to be presented at the TCT meeting in about uh, six weeks, and so we will get a lot closer to the final answer here. This is a trial of 3,000 patients undergoing uh, TAVR with or without the Sentinel device. The primary endpoint is stroke at 72 hours, uh, and importantly, all the patients in this trial were uh, um, uh, evaluated by a neurologist both prior to and after the procedure. So um, we have a very sensitive assay for stroke. Uh, you can see the, the, uh, the British trial is even bigger, um, but has probably a little bit less sensitive of an assay for stroke. So while we're waiting for that information, uh, we have to really ask ourselves, what, what evidence do we have, given the randomized trials, um, and that given that we're waiting for these, that there's benefit of embolic protection in current practice. And so a couple of years ago, uh, before the protected TAVR trial was even announced, uh, we said we should look at this carefully in the, in the TVT registry in the United States, which is the registry of all TAVR patients treated in the United States. We did a study 
of about 130,000 patients who underwent elective or urgent TAVR over a two-year period during which the Sentinel device was approved. After excluding uh, some patients with alternative access and a few other uh, minor exclusions, we were left with an analytic cohort of about 123,000 patients. And you can see of those, um, about 10% of them got an embolic protection device and about 110,000, about 90% of them did not receive an embolic protection device. And the endpoint of our study that we pre-specified was in-hospital stroke. Now, one thing that made this study kind of interesting and one of the reasons I, was, I, I, I like doing it is we did the primary analysis by a technique called instrumental variable analysis. This is a way of analyzing data that is sort of a quasi-randomized design. And it takes advantage of differences in practice across the different hospitals rather than across the patients. It comes from economics. And what it really does, um, in contrast to our typical observational studies, is it allows us to account for both measured and unmeasured confounding. confounding. And the instrument that we used, the, the separator, was the site-level performance for embolic protection use during the calendar quarter, and I'll show you that in just a second. We also did a more conventional propensity-adjusted uh, method uh, that is like things that you've often seen with observational data, but the problem here is this only accounts for measured confounding, whereas the instrumental variable analysis also accounts for unmeasured confounding. So let's just look at the, the sort of what happened over time uh, during that two-year uh, two-year period, we can see that the proportion of hospitals in the United States that were using embolic protection in at least um, a small number of cases was increasing fairly steadily. But you can see the proportion of patients receiving embolic protection um, you know, was, was increasing much more slowly. Um, and this is the variance that we were actually taking advantage of, uh, looking at this large number of hospitals that never used embolic protection and comparing their outcomes to those in the smaller proportion of hospitals that used it quite a bit. And here's our primary outcome, in-hospital stroke. And you can see there was a trend towards a reduction in hospital stroke, about a 10% relative reduction, but it wasn't at all statistically significant. And when we look across all of the other outcomes, uh, death, death or stroke, um, anything else, looking at it at 30 days, we saw no significant differences uh, in stroke, uh, regardless of how we looked at it in the instrumental variable analysis. But as I mentioned, we also did a more conventional analysis, a propensity-weighted analysis. And here we actually did see a very small, but statistically significant reduction in stroke, about an 18% relative reduction. And you may sort of look at this and say, well, what am I supposed to make of these data? They go in opposite directions. But the truth is, if you actually look at them side by side uh, on this graph, they actually are more similar than different. Uh, the only difference is the instrumental variable analysis has somewhat wider variance. So what do we conclude from this is that if there is a reduction in stroke, it's more modest than one might think uh, based on the mechanism of action of these, uh, uh, of these devices. So that brings us back to the final question and the question that we started with, which is how do we select patients right now uh, for embolic protection? I think we saw um, maybe eight or so TAVRs today. I don't think I saw any one of them getting embolic protection. So um, maybe that's the answer. But is there any evidence that we can select patients um, uh, uh, based on clinical characteristics? This is a model we published a few years ago, looking again at data from the TVT registry, looking at a number of different risk factors uh, that are associated with an increased risk of stroke. But the key message here is that the C statistic indicating how well we can actually predict stroke is very low, 0.62. Remember, 0.5 with a C statistic is a coin flip. And so the implication here is that patient selection based on risk stratification is likely to be fairly challenging. We're just not that good at protecting stroke, uh, excuse me, at, at uh, predicting stroke. The one area where we did see some differences is going back again to looking at uh, the data from that instrumental variable analysis that we did and looking at different patient characteristics in the TBT registry. And here we actually do see two subgroups where there seemed to be at least a strong trend towards a very substantial reduction in stroke, about a 1% absolute reduction. And that was patients with bicuspid anatomy and patients undergoing valve and valve procedures. Here, it wasn't that the risk was so high, but the benefits seemed to be very great in those two, po in those two populations. Finally, I just want to leave you with one other thought, which is we've been focusing here on stroke, and the trials that we're going to be seeing uh, next month um, are also focused on stroke, but maybe we're missing a lot of the story. There is uh, evidence that em you know, emboli, asymptomatic cerebral emboli, are associated with neurocognitive decline. So far, we've not been able to see a difference in neurocognitive function in the trials, but again, the trials that have been done so far are fairly small. So just to leave you with a couple of uh, take-home messages, um, I think it's very clear that stroke remains a significant and importantly unpredictable complication after TAVR. 
Um, there is no question that our current generation of cerebral embolic protection devices do capture um, de uh, debris during a TAVR procedure and likely, although not, to, not for sure, uh, reduce the volume of new brain lesions. However, I would say still, you know, at this point, about four years after their release, uh, the clinical benefit of embolic protection devices remains uncertain despite increasing use in the United States, and we really are awaiting uh, the definitive evidence. Um, and I think also very importantly is that selective use is difficult to justify at present with the possible exception of the valve and valve TAVR and bic bicuspid aortic stenosis, where I think our data from the TVT registry are strongly suggestive of a benefit. And finally, I think in order to continue to move this field forward, we do need to do, continue to do more research on the long-term neurocognitive effects of non-disabling and clinically silent strokes, because that may ultimately be uh, the major target for these devices. Thank you very much. Any, <clears throat> any questions for David? Yeah, Dave, what's your personal practice and why? So in Kansas City, my personal practice is we didn't use them. Because of he, financial hospitals? Because of, yeah, exactly. In the, but in New York, where I am now, we use them 100%. Um, so I think those are the two, the two right answers to me in 20, you know, 2022 to the question of who should use them in is either everybody or nobody. Um, there's not a lot of you know, uh, case selection because I don't think we just don't predict it very well. So well, you have David, to pick which one you're on. Why didn't you use it in the ones that you identified? The bicuspid and valve and valve why don't in Kansas. I? Why don't we use it or why? Yeah. The, I mean, we use it in those for sure. But again, New York City, for a variety of reasons, is a very competitive environment where everybody feels compelled to use every single thing. And so we use it, you know, unless the arch anatomy is unfavorable or we can't position it, we use it in everybody now. But again, I would say that the evidence is not that strong that that's the right thing to do. Okay. David, so the, from your TVT data, do you think there's enough power in the protect TAVR to really show a difference or not. 3,000, is it enough? Well, I can tell you that when, when we did this analysis, the week after we published it, I called Samir Kapadia, who's yeah. the PI of the study, and I said, you're underpowered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I said, you're, you, mean you need twice as many patients yeah. because the study is powered to detect a very large reduction in stroke, and I don't think, I don't think it's there. Now, I have, you know, again, I know nothing about what the results show, anything like that. Um, I have you know, no, no insight whatsoever. I do think that there is a pretty good signal emerging, and I'm kind of pissed at myself that we didn't look at this in the TVT data, that although the, the Sentinel device may not reduce all stroke, it may well reduce large stroke. And if it does that, I think that would also be very convincing. But again, this is purely speculation based on some other observational stuff, and I, I can't, you know, can't vouch for it in my own data because we didn't look. Well, the, the Cleveland group also showed that with the national well, inpatient the, sample. Yeah, that's exactly whose the data I'm talking about. And they just no. published, they actually just published this week a single center study from their own center suggesting the same thing. So I think it's entirely possible that the stroke signal is not there, but the major stroke signal is there. Um, but, you know, in, in five weeks, we'll know. And you said all that minor stuff, too, that you might not be counting for. Well, the, yeah, I mean, the, the neurocognitive and all those sort of things. But it's, you know, again, I think it's, it's, it's really an interesting question. I don't know. Let's, I mean, show of hands down the, you know, down the panel here. So who uses embolic protection in more than 50% of your TAVR procedures? And I, and I struggled with deciding who. So I said you know, I had two major strokes in the last five years, and I didn't use it, and I thought I was making the right decision. Yeah. And I realized I don't know. So no, I think, I mean, I think the major, you know, again, it's, this is pure speculation um, that the major ones, you know, cause you, I mean, you catch a big chunk. That's probably a major stroke that you prevent. And as, a, as an operator, those are those devastating, are devastating to you and to the patient. They just, they really. No, they are. And so, yeah. I mean, I think we, but, uh, but you know, I'm mostly really glad that, you know, we're going to get the evidence that we need to move this forward. Cause it's, it's been frustrating not to have it. I'm also concerned about on the power uh, possibility of the American study and British study because in TBT registry, risk reduction is less than 20%. And the expectation in American study, they expect 50% reduction from 4 to 2%. Yeah. In British, 33% reduction from 3 to 2%. Thus, both studies would be very insufficient. Right. In I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I completely agree. Thus, like uh, I thus, uh, how do you uh, the, uh, think about the poor analysis of both American and British study? I mean, for sure, I, I assume that they're planning on pooling the analysis when it's all done. Um, but, you know, but I think you're, you're, 
I mean, your conclusion is the same one I faced, which is looking at these these observational data, it's hard to think there's a 50% reduction. It just doesn't seem to be there. Um, and, you know, we'll see. Um, and, you know, but I, I'm, I'm more hopeful that the, the, the large strokes, because, again, the data on large strokes suggests there could be as much as, a, you know, a 70 or 80% reduction in the large strokes. So let's say that's the case, then you should, we should use it 100%, like, you know, occasionally you catch a big stroke? I, th I, mean, I, I mean, my view, if, if we can show it reduces large strokes, we should use it in everybody. I mean, that's, because I think it's just right now our ability to predict the strokes is not good enough. So I guess it depends on what is the incidence of a large stroke, right? Because if the last stroke is yeah. one in a million, you'd reduce it for 2.5. They're not one. I mean, we I know, know they're not. I know. You know. I'm just saying that, you know, yeah. it depends on the incidence of the large right. stroke. Then. Like I said, I mean, I, I really wish we had been thought of it, when, you know, three years ago when we did our study, because we could have had a pretty good answer to it, but we, we messed up. Thank you. Yes. Let's move on to our last lecture. Um, Professor Kim, um, Hun Su Kim, is going to talk about minimizing and managing conduction abnormalities after TAVR. Uh, great, thanks for the invitation, uh, Dr. Park. Uh, uh, for the last uh, next uh, 10 minutes, I'd like to uh, present the uh, issue of conduction abnormality after TAVI. Uh, this is a view from the left, left ventricle after opening of anterior wall. Here is a septum, another septum, membrane septum. The left bundle branch emerges from right side to the left ventricle at the point of here. That is below the membrane septum between NCC and RCC. Please remember this anatomy. When we, analyze, when we see the valve structure from the head, left and right, left sinus, right sinus, non-coronary sinus. AV node uh, passed from the right atrium, right ventricle, and the left ventricle. Exactly between, through the between, RCC and NCC. Thus, if you have heavy calcification in the annular structure of left sinus, the valve, implant valve, is biased toward this point, leading to Maybe a conduction abnormality. Once again, a normal anatomy, the valvular stenosis anatomy uh, from the left ventricle. Once again, membrane septum, muscular septum is the emerging point of left bundle branch between right and non coronary sinus. What's the instance of the onset conduction abnormality after TAVI? It varies depending on the cohort. And the important rate of permanent pacemaker implantation is about 10%, even in the next generation, TAVI era. Here is an instance of new onset LBBB among various kinds of TAVI devices. In first generation, Sapien XT, about 15%, uh, 10%, core valve, around 40% and Lotus about more than 50%. Sapien 3, uh, the rate is not decreased. This is new onset LBBB, a little bit higher than high degree and complete AB block. That is about uh, less than 10% in Sapien XT and more than 20% in core valve. Uh, that does not decrease in case of Sapien 3, a little bit higher than Sapien XT in terms of high degree AB block. Thus, these results do not support the reduction in pacemaker implantation rate since the arrival of newer generation devices. Uh, we had the chance to analyze new onset AV block after TAVI in our SNUH uh, cohort until 2018. We uh, selected more than 200 patients without baseline AV block and analyzed about 26 patients showed complete AV block after TAVI about 14 patients uh, showed early recovery. But in 12 patients, they showed the persistent AV block required permanent pacemaker. But several months later, four patients showed delayed recovery. Actually, only eight patients showed persistent AV block requiring permanent pacemaker. In this court, about balloon and self-expand valve half and half. Here is time course of new onset AV block after TAVI. This is onset of TAVI 
after uh, onset of complete AV block after TAVI. On the day of TAVI, uh, about 11 patients. One day after TAVI, three. Three days, seven. Five days, five patients. Important thing is the earlier onset AV block showed lower instance, lower rate of transient recovery, requiring a high percentage of permanent pacemaker. But patients who showed AV block in the later phase, they uh, usually uh, showed recovery and uh, uh, avoiding the pacemaker implantation. To summarize this cohort, about among 206 patients, 26 patients showed complete AV block, about 13% instance. Half showed early recovery, another half, 6%, uh, required per pacemaker implantation rate. But actually, 2% of the patients uh, showed delayed recovery. Only 4% of whole cohort showed persistent AV block and required uh, permanent pacemaker implantation. When we analyze serial ECG change after TAVI, there is a, a, a delta PL interval, PL prolongation, and QRS prolongation is observed in all patients. This is before TAVI, at the day of TAVI, and one day, uh, seven day, and one month. PR prolongation and QRS uh, prolongation is observed in most of the patients, but uh, they uh, are recovered around at one month. Here is a predictors of permanent pacemaker implantation after TAVI. ECG and patient factor shown here. Our BBB is very strong predictor. First degree AV block, PR interval prolongation, and left anterior hemi block. Patient factor, old age is very important, male sex and higher BMI. How about anatomical and procedural profiles that predict AV block after TAVI is severe mitral annular calcification as shown, I, uh, as shown before. I uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, interpret the result, uh, the rationale, uh, the pathophysiology of the association between annular classification and AV block. And then left LV, left cusp outflow tract classification that also David implanted valve toward LBBB emerging point, such as between right and non coronary cusp. Shorter membrane septum is not good, personal outer. Procedure self expand valve showed higher incidence of AV block, deeper implantation, bigger valve, balloon dilatation, and uh, uh, valve in valve procedure. Here's another uh, uh, important issue regarding the membrane septum. The shorter, the worse. Uh, here is we can see the membrane septum length is uh, variable. Thus they, they usually classified the low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, depending on the length of membrane septum, three to seven. They analyzed 1,800 patients treated with sapien, avalet, accurate, nail. Interesting finding is this is a pacemaker implantation rate of sapien, avalet, accurate, as we all uh, uh, we know that the membrane septum is shorter, implantation rate is very high. But interesting finding is instance of pacemaker implantation in accurate is very low, regardless of length of membrane septum. But to summarize, predictors of pacemaker implantation after TAVI, here is the ECG factor, uh, intraprocedural AV block, Bank park AV conduction delay with rapid atrial pacing, pre-existing first degree AV block, pre-existing RBBB, pre-existing LBBB, and uh, left hand hemi block. Here is procedural factor: pre-ballooning and post-ballooning, uh, oversizing uh, device. Natural core valve is worse than Edward Sapien valve, and deeper implantation. An additional factor that we neglected is mitral, uh, mitral annular classification and uh, classification at uh, device landing zone. 
We also analyze multivariate risk analysis for new onset AV block or pacemaking implantation in our SNU cohort, oversizing deeper implantation, baseline RBBB, and avalot uh, risk factors for such kind of event. Here's actual scatter plot showing implantation depth and oversized index that influenced no AV block, recovered AV block, and pacemaker implantation. Because in this uh, uh, data, uh, if we oversizing, uh, if you do oversizing and uh, deeper implantation, there is instance uh, pacemaker implantation. But actually, 6% is not uh, accurate, uh, appropriate oversizing. It is undersizing. Uh, personally, I believe uh, ideal oversize index is about 10% in Sapien 3 and 20% in Ablet. The 6% oversizing is definitely undersizing. The issue uh, here, uh, the teaching point here is implantation depth. Even though there is huge oversizing, if it is implanted in the shallow, there is no chance of pacemaker implantation. Guideline is shown here, a complete or high degree AV block persisting for more than uh, one day after TAVI or new onset alternating BBB after TAVI is indication for permanent pacing. Thus, if you observe persistent high degree AV block, you just uh, do a permanent pacemaker implantation. New onset alternate BBBB, you can do a uh, pacemaker implantation. Or pre-existing RBBB with new post-procedure conduction disturbance, you can do uh, implantation of pacemaker. How long do we have to wait? In our court, uh, mean duration from AV block onset to recovery is about three days. Thus, in our institute, maintaining a temporary pacemaker for at least three days uh, might be a reasonable approach, and we adopt such kind of strategy. Jack Scientific Expert Panel recommended inpatient monitoring at least two days for all patients with following profiles, such as increased PR QRS interval by more than 20 milliseconds with pre-existing wide QRS interval or first three AV block, the onset LBBB, and AV block during procedure. In conclusion, conduction disturbance are still common, but most of them show the spontaneous recovery. The several days of watchful observation may be reasonable. Old age, RBB, and implantation depth and ballooning are risk factors. Anatomy tailored uh, valve selection is uh, uh, recommended. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we're going to just end this session and we might get the report back from Germany later uh, for the discussion that they've been going on with them. So um, thank you, everyone. And I think move on to the next session, which is going to be chaired by, I think, um, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Park. Oh, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Park.